All righty, let's go ahead and get started. Any questions before we get rolling today? All right, then let's start our game plan. Today we start our urinary system. We'll be doing this for the next three lectures. Uh, during that time, you have four assignments that are gonna be due. Uh, on Thursday, you've got your first unit review and your labster. Remember for full credit on that labster, you must complete the whole activity and get at least 80% correct. Uh, next Tuesday, one week from today, your second unit review is due as is your physio X exercise nine, which has six different activities, which means six different lab reports. And all of which leads up to uh, one week from this coming Thursday when we have our lab and lecture exam on both the respiratory system and the urinary system. So hopefully you use this weekend to complete your mastery of the respiratory system. And so we can focus on the urinary system from here. All right, any questions on that? Excellent, one of my favorite fun, the stunned silences. All right, so wait, hold on. There is one. Um, so I Right, we were talking about the teeth whitening, if I remember correctly. So, okay, that, that ammonia sounds good as well. I mean, it would also uh, act as a whitening agent. Like I said, I know urine was used as a uh, for for cleaning of um, laundry, and for the use of laundry because it could help to whiten things. I assumed it was the uric acid, but uh, ammonia makes sense for the the reason that would be that as well. So, I think that that's reasonable. Uh, I again wouldn't encourage it, but uh, again, to, to each his own. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Although, you know, who knows if uh, detergent becomes uh, scarce or they outlaw it because of people eating Tide Pods and we all may be back to urinating in our clothes again. So who knows? We'll find out. All right. Excellent. So uh, like we did for the respiratory system, we're going to do a similar thing uh, for the urinary system. We are going to start today primarily talking anatomy. So we've got a lot of anatomy. We'll look at some histology, talk about the histology resources that are available if you're not using those already uh, and to help you to be successful with that. And then once we have the anatomy done today, then we'll spend the next two uh, lectures talking about the physiology of the urinary system. As always, when we have an organ system, uh, we have the primary organ or organs that are responsible for the function of that system and then all of the accessory organs uh, and uh, the urinary system is no exception to that. The primary organ in the urinary system is indeed the kidney. Uh, and it is the functional part. It is the rock star of the urinary system. And the urinary system is probably the worst named of all of the systems or the least appropriately named of all of the systems. Is the ultimate goal of the urinary system to make urine? Is making urine a vital function of the body? No. No, what is it that they actually does? Is it filtering? Yeah, it's filtering the blood, absolutely. It is vitally important, that filtering of the blood. While you're sitting here calmly in class, assuming you're not you know, on a treadmill while you're listening to this lecture, um, about 25% of your blood is going to it towards your kidneys to be filtered and to be processed. I think as we've talked about before, uh, you know, life is lazy. It, you know, it doesn't necessarily try to make everything as efficient as it possibly can. It just goes with what works. Right? Could you survive without one lung? Yeah, you could. Would you necessarily be able to be a professional athlete with just one lung? No, probably not. Could you survive with one eye? Yeah, again, you probably wouldn't be able to be a professional athlete, but especially like a baseball player or a, a wide receiver or something like that, because your depth perception would be a bit off, but you could survive. However, if you lose one kidney, does that change the function of your body? Could you be a professional athlete with one kidney? 
Yeah, it turns out you could be, right? Absolutely. One kidney is capable of doing every all the filtering necessary. If you lost a kidney, sold it on eBay, whatever, um, you would your remaining kidney would enlarge slightly, but it would be quite capable of doing all of the function necessary. This is tremendous redundancy with the kidneys, uh, which probably says something about how vital it is. Now, as I mentioned, you would function perfectly and you could be a professional athlete with one kidney, but you probably might not want to because if you damage that second kidney, what's your prognosis then? Can you survive without two kidneys? No. There may be short-term solutions like dialysis, but dialysis truly is a short-term solution. Without a kidney transplant, uh, you will not survive without two function, without any functioning kidneys, absolutely. So the kidneys are vitally important, not because they make urine, but because they filter the blood. Making the urine is just the byproduct, and it's the obvious part of it. It's the part that comes out of you. We don't see the filtering of the blood. We see the urine, and that's probably why it was named that. The rest of the urinary system's job really uh, with the urinary tract, the two ureters, the one bladder and the one urethra, their job really is only in storage and removal. They don't do any processing. They don't modify the urine once it's produced at all. Their sole goal is to collect it, hold it until you get to a socially appropriate location and then allow you to void it. And that's pretty much all the urinary tract does, right? Even if you think about the conducting zone in our respiratory system, at least it's processing, warming the air, moistening the air, cleaning the air, but not the urinary tract. The urinary tract does not process the material at all. It is simply for, you know, collecting and storing till it can be voided. All right. As always, let's talk about the functions of the urinary system. We've already talked about how the key is to filter the blood. That is obviously, oops, wrong button. Our goal is to filter the blood, but we can be more specific than that. In filtering the blood, we are moving waste materials. Uh, like ammonia, like urea from the breakdown of amino acids, uh, like bilirubin from the breakdown of our hemoglobin, uh, like creatine from the breakdown of muscle and muscle metabolism, uh, uric acid from the breakdown of uh, nucleic acids. We have all these wastes and any kind of other foreign substances that need to be released from the body. It also plays a very important role in helping us to maintain our appropriate ion concentration. Now, again, this is for the blood, but remember because of that uh, filtration that takes place, or, or let me say that, uh, the exchange that takes place in the capillaries, anytime we modify the blood, remember we are also modifying the interstitial fluid. So any modifications we make to the blood, we're affecting the interstitial fluid of all the tissues of our body as well. So changes to the blood, um, blood plasma more specifically affect the interstitial fluid of the tissues of our body. So it helps us to maintain appropriate concentrations of all of our ions that are necessary, high levels of sodium, low levels of potassium and so on and so forth. <clears throat> it is going to directly help us to regulate our blood volume. After all, the water component of our urine comes from the blood plasma. So the more blood plasma we pull out, not only is it a more urine that we produce, but also the slower the blood volume. And what do we know goes hand in hand with blood volume? If you change the volume of blood in our body, what else do you change? Blood pressure, yep. absolutely. So this is going to indirectly affect blood pressure. So here we have an indirect effect on blood pressure by changing the blood volume. But guess what? It also directly affects blood pressure as well. And it directly affects blood pressure as well, primarily by the release of a hormone-like protein. Oops. 
It is an actual protein, but is a protein that acts very much like a hormone. And that hormone-like protein is renin. Renin, as we'll see, we, we mentioned it briefly when we were talking in the endocrine system. Uh, we were talking about uh, the renin, uh, angiotensin, aldosterone. We talked about that in the cardiovascular system as well. So now we'll actually really get down deep and dirty into that renin, uh, angiotensin, aldosterone mechanism of how we can help to uh, directly control blood pressure. So notice it controls, controls blood volume directly, which indirectly controls blood pressure, and it also directly controls blood pressure. Isn't renin produced only in infants? No, uh, no, you're thinking of, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, you're thinking of the uh, enzyme in the, um, the digestive system. I can't think of it what it is, but you were correct. There was a there was a um, enzyme in the stomach that was produced that helped us to break down the yeah. uh, milk fats and the milk uh, uh, sugars. Yeah. Uh, but I don't remember off the top of my head what that is. But no, in this case, renin is produced by the kidney. Okay. Uh, do do do. Clear all that. Another important function of the kidney is to maintain the blood osmolarity. Remember, osmolarity is just the measure of the amount of stuff that we have in the blood plasma, right? If you have one glucose, if you have one amino acid, if you have one sodium, when it comes to being stuff in the blood, are those things the same or are those things different? I got one of each. I got one same and one different. If I have, let's think of it this way, three beakers, four beakers. In this first beaker, I have 10 glucose. In this second beaker, I have 10 sodium. And in this third beaker, I have, I don't know, what was the third thing I said? I don't remember what it was anymore. Uh, amino acids. Would the osmolarity in these three beakers be the same or would they be different? Excellent, I got two sames, but two sames by the same person, that doesn't count. Same, excellent, same. Remember, it is the measure of the overall stuff. So 10 glucose counts the same as 10 sodium, count the same as 10 amino acid. What about if in this fourth beaker, I had 10 of whatever units we're talking about of table salt? Would that be the same or would that be different? There you go, Ryan's got it. The size of the molecule does not matter. It's just the number of things. You're just counting the number of things. So this fourth beaker that has 10 units of table salt, is that the same as 10 units of amino acid or 10 units of sodium or 10 units of glucose? Ah, bingo, Bill's got it. it it'd be different. It would actually have double the osmolarity because as you have correctly pointed out, table salt disassociates into sodium ions and, and chloride ions. So what would happen is if you have 10 units of table salt, you had, would have 10 sodium, you would have 10 chloride, you would have 23, uh, pardon me, 20 things in this fourth beaker. So this one would have more stuff. Notice it isn't a measure of the size. It isn't a measure of the mass. Osmolarity is really just a count of the number of things, whatever those things are. And so while it is directly controlling things like how much sodium, how much potassium, how much calcium, it's also measuring how much stuff because the stuff in our blood matters, right? We here in Sacramento know that better than just about anybody because if you were to drink a massive amount of water in a very short period of time to win an extremely now outdated video game system, you would have way more water in relation to stuff you would upset the osmolarity of your blood, 
which would upset the osmolarity of your interstitial fluid, which would lead to cellular damage, cell death, organ failure, and ultimately death. Try not to wee to win a wee. Right, so absolutely, it isn't just about the right amount of sodium, but it's also just about the right amount of stuff. All right, excellent. We remember when we were talking about our respiratory system, we were talking about how our respiratory system plays an important role of helping us to regulate our blood pH. How did our respiratory system help us to regulate our blood pH? Can someone remind me of that? The levels of CO2. Excellent. And why were the CO2 levels so important in helping us to determine what the pH level of the blood was? The higher level of CO2, the uh, more acidic the blood. Absolutely. Because as someone pointed out, absolutely, you guys are right. When uh, carbon dioxide mixes with water, it forms that carbonic acid two CO three, oops, three carbonic acid. And as we know that carbonic acid can disassociate into hydrogen ions uh, and also into bicarbonate ions. So uh, in this case of the respiratory system, by controlling how much carbon dioxide was in the blood, we could affect the pH of the blood. But the kidney's job is to filter things in and out of the blood. So by also controlling how much hydrogen ions, by also controlling how much bicarbonate is located in the blood, our urinary system can affect the pH of the blood here. If the blood is too acidic, we can get rid of um, hydrogen ions. We could bring a bicarbonate back. If on the other hand, right, there is not enough, uh, if the blood is too basic, we can hold on to more, reabsorb more sodium, uh, pardon me, more hydrogen ions, keeping them, we can get rid of bicarbonate. So by getting rid of hydrogen ions, by getting rid of bicarbonate, we can also affect the acidity of the blood. So we're using the same chemical reaction. It all still has to do with CO2 in the water but where the respiration we deal with the CO2 end, here we're dealing with the hydrogen and the bicarbonate end of things. Controlling those, and we can control the pH of the blood. And if that wasn't enough that our kidneys did for us, our kidneys also produce hormones. Renin, like we talked about, which is not a hormone, right? It uh, is a hormone-like protein, a protein that acts like a hormone, but is not actually a hormone. But we have talked about some specific hormones that are produced in the kidney. Uh, the erythropoietin is a hormone produced by the kidney. And remind me again what that erythropoietin does. Regulates the uh, amount of red blood cells. Excellent, helps to regulate the amount of red blood cells, causes those pluripotent hemocytoblasts to, uh, uh, to become more of the pro-urethroblasts and, and it also causes them to mature more quickly. Excellent. Uh, kidney is also where we activate and produce the active form of calcitriol. What's the inactive form of calcitriol again? Vitamin D. Vitamin D. So that vitamin D, which remember is produced by uh, energizing a specific uh, uh, cholesterol in our skin, uh, then gets activated into calcitriol in our kidney. And remind me again what calcitriol does. It regulates uh, amount of calcium in the blood. How? You're absolutely correct. How does it do that though specifically? It's... Um... Uh, increase the amount of calcium in blood, right? Absolutely correct. But how? How does it get more calcium into the blood? Anyone? How does calcitriol get more calcium into the blood? Where does it get the calcium from? Oh, okay, we're getting closer. Allows for absorption from where? Bones. Not from our bones, not from our kidney. 
Small intestine. There we go. Absolutely. Right. Remember, calcitriol is what tells our digestive system to absorb the calcium. Yeah. You could drink a whole cow's worth of milk. If you don't have calcitriol in your body, in your blood, uh, then your digestive system is not going to be able to absorb a large amount of that calcium. It'll only absorb a small amount. So calcitriol is what tells our digestive system to, hey, any calcium in there, bring it on in. All right. And lastly, one other special function. Again, this isn't a normal function that it has to do in normal situations. However, in cases of uh, fasting is probably the best example of this. When individuals fast for social or religious reasons, uh, what can happen is that affects our blood glucose levels. Obviously, you're not getting the blood glucose levels that you need. And so what our kidney is actually able to do, it is it actually able to convert the amino acid glutamine into glucose. That process is called gluconeogenesis, the giving birth of new glucose. So again, it's one of those big alphabet soup words that I'm sure at some point or another you'll have to spell on the exam. But that is that process, typically in cases of starvation, in cases of uh, when someone is fasting, uh, then the kidney has the ability to be able to start converting uh, the glutamine amino acid into glucose to help to regulate glucose levels. All right, questions on that. So as you can see, like the liver, our kidney truly is a rock star. And notice, nowhere in any of that did we say the word urine. It really, it really gets a rough shot when it comes to the naming of this organ system. All right, questions on that? All right, now that we know the function of the urinary system in the kidneys, let's talk about the location of the kidneys. As we know, the kidneys are one of our retroperitoneal organs, meaning it is located behind the uh, parietal peritoneum anchored to the posterior wall of the abdominal cavity. Uh, it has the adrenal glands sitting on the superior portion of it. Here we see a great superior view from a transverse section. And again, what we can see really nicely here is that parietal peritoneum that lines the cavity and the kidneys are behind it. Now we know organs like, for instance, the duodenum uh, that is back here, retroperitoneal, has that adventitia that anchors it and holds it in place. Notice the kidney is anchored and held in place by a much more elaborate structure. Basically, there is a pocket that is formed here inside the space behind the peritoneal cavity. And as you can see, this pocket is formed uh, by a structure. Let me move this out of the way so we can see that a little bit better. Let's go ahead and do that. Um, as we can see, there is this pocket here that is formed known as the renal fascia. Fascia is a term we used before talking about a dense irregular connective tissue that helps to stabilize and hold muscles, <clears throat> excuse me, muscles in place. Well, here we have a fascia as well. It is one fascia, but notice it has two components to it. It has the anterior renal fascia, which is anterior to the kidney and the posterior renal fascia, which is posterior to the renal kidney, I mean, to the kidney. So that's convenient. Forming a pocket in between. And that pocket contains the kidney. However, right, just like any pocket, if you've got one of those padded envelopes that you wanna mail something in and you wanna provide more protection, you're gonna put some peanuts in there, some of those or some bubble wrap or something to provide some protection. In this case, that structure providing that support, providing that protection is adipose tissue. And this adipose tissue is what is known as the perirenal fat capsule. Perirenal means, of course, around the kidney. 
and it's a fat capsule. We've talked before, we talked a little bit briefly about it when we were talking about uh, digestion. We were talking about stomach stapling and, stubble, stub, uh, and uh, stomach banding and those types of extreme weight loss activities, right? Thanksgiving is right around the corner and we got to look good for the family, right? When you're, because when you zoom, as we know, the camera adds 10 pounds. So you're going to go on the popcorn diet eating one piece of popcorn for breakfast, one for lunch, and two pieces of popcorn for dinner, all right? Or you'll get your stomach stapled or your stomach banded or something along those lines, In, or uh, go on the biggest loser or any of these types of situations. When people do this type of extreme weight loss, one of the things that the doctors monitoring them monitor very closely is their urine output. The reason for that is, as we've talked about before, fat is very dynamic, constantly being bundled up and shifted and moved around our body, right? However, if you rapidly lose weight, as you're losing that fat, you don't just lose the subcutaneous fat that everybody cares about because it's on top. What happens is you lose fat everywhere in your body, including this fat capsule that is around the kidney. And one of the concerns with that is we know this kidney is connected by the ureter to the bladder. And if we lose the weight too rapidly, if we lose that fat capsule around the kidney, what can happen is the kidney can actually descend. It won't be held in place anymore and it will descend in the abdominal pelvic cavity. It is a condition called a ptosis. Now the ptosis by itself isn't that big of a deal. But what happens when it descends is that it can actually cause a kinking of the ureter. And of course, as you know, when you kink a hose, what happens? It blocks the flow. Yeah, in fact, two important things happen. One is it blocks the flow, so no urine continues to the bladder and out of the body. But the other thing that happens is the urine backs up into the kidney causing a dramatic increase in pressure inside the kidney. And that dramatic increase in pressure can severely damage the kidney. So with that, with that rapid weight loss, they are dramatically and closely monitoring their urine output because if urine output decreases, it could be an indication of a very, very serious condition. So that fat capsule is important for supporting and sustaining and anchoring that kidney in place. And then of course, I can see like many organs we have talked about in this class, uh, it also has its own candy coated shell on the outer surface. And that candy coated shell on the outer surface is the fibrous capsule. Again, we've seen many things, lymph nodes, spleen, lots of things that have that fibrous capsule on the outer surface. The adrenal gland sitting on top of it has a fibrous capsule. So again, so the, these three layers of support and protection around the kidney, the renal fascia, both front and back, the um, fat capsule that surrounds it, and then that fibrous capsule. That's a great question. Um, my guess is when it occurs, again, to gain the, the, you don't have to necessarily gain the weight to get the adipose to move back to that space. Adipose will move dynamically. So in time, it will redistribute throughout the body and would fill that space, but that would probably take a significant amount of time. So my guess is that what would have to happen is you would have to either surgically put a stint in the ureter so that it didn't bend or they may have to actually surgically ascend the kidney and anchor it in place mechanically until that support reformed. Because yeah. again, the, 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 the increase in pressure is gonna be very dramatic and very rapid and can be damaging, very, very damaging to it. So you wouldn't wanna wait for the fat to come back on its own to provide that support. Or you can just hang upside down all the time. That would do it too. All right. Um, it's a great question. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm not sure that I would say, for instance, there is so much of an order in which it is burned, just simply because 
uh, the adipose is very dynamic. Like I said, uh, the the oil droplets, the fat vacuoles inside an adipose are constantly changing. They're constantly bunging, bundling up their uh, fats and distributing through them throughout the body. So my guess is that as your metabolism increased, as you started to burn more fat, uh, what would happen is, as you had less of it, then it would tend to want to accumulate more in areas where it was more important, like the kidney, as opposed to other areas that are less important, like uh, the subcutaneous layer of the skin, for instance, or things like that. But I don't think that there's necessarily an order when you people rapidly lose weight, they don't like lose all the fat on their left arm first, and then their belly, and then on their back, or whatever else it is like that. So I don't think there's necessarily an order. I think that... Uh, that it's dynamic enough that as long as it's not an extreme radical weight loss, that it's able to be distributed into the important areas and maintained in the areas where it is important. Great question. Now we did that, we did that, we did that. Perfect. Uh, as I mentioned, it is retroperitoneal. Notice it is partially protected by the uh, ribs in that retroperitoneal position. However, notice also that the uh, kidneys are asymmetrical in their location. The right kidney is slightly lower than the left. Why might that be the, play, the case? Because of the liver? Yeah, okay. absolutely. The liver, which is on the right side, uh, because it's such a large organ, it basically depresses the right kidney and, and forces the displaces the right kidney into a slightly lower location. So notice also it's slightly less protected by the ribs. And so for a blow to the, black, to the back, uh, you're much more likely to damage your right kidney than you are to damage your left. Our kidney has a uh, kidney bean shape to it. Again, a shape we are very familiar with where it has a convex and a concave side to it. That concave side is again known as the hilum. And that hilum is basically where all of the structures like the ureter, like the blood vessels, like the nerves enter into the space inside of the kidney, as we'll see, there is a space inside the kidney here. And this space is known as the renal sinus. So again, sinus is an air filled space. Uh, hilum is that in indented surface on that concave structure with a convex outer surface. So again, this is anatomy we are somewhat familiar with. All right. And if you don't like my drawing of it, here we have some pretty pictures that show the same thing. Uh, notice, let's start with this one here because I think this one does a really nice job of showing this. Let me use the highlighter and let's use the purple to really indicate it. If you look closely, there is indeed a space here. They've done a nice job of indicating that here at the hilum there is a space. Now, of course, this space isn't gonna be completely empty there are these tubular stuck structures that we see in the space. And we'll talk about those in a little bit. But notice also the space is also filled with adipose. That adipose from the fat capsule will also enter into this space as well. That a fibrous capsule, that, ren that renal capsule on its outer surface, that candy coated shell we talked about will also go deep into the sinus as well. So we'll see that lining the sinus as well. So it is sinus is indeed this space where the hilum is located, but it's not a completely empty space. There is going to be stuff within that space. All right, but let's take a closer look with a bigger picture at some of the anatomy. This one does a really nice job of showing it as well and indicating that there are three primary regions to the kidney. The first is the renal cortex. Again, we've seen this type of organization before as well. We have an outer layer, we have an inner layer. The outer layer is known as the cortex. And what is the inner layer known as? Medulla. Medulla, excellent. However, you notice there is some specialness to 
our kidney here. Again, as we know, we have our cortex and the cortex is going to be this outer tissue. It is a very uh, granular tissue when you get a chance to look at it, if you ever get a chance to look at it. Uh, and there's a massive amount of blood vessels in it as well. And it is the outer area. This is where the majority of the work takes place. Our renal cortex uh, contains the functional and the structural units of the kidney, and those are the nephrons. And the nephrons are uh, what do the job of filtering the blood. However, you will also notice that there are extensions of the cortex that penetrate deeper down into the kidney. These extensions of the cortex are what are known as the renal columns. So as you can see, we have that cortex and then that cortex penetrates deep into the kidney forming our renal columns. The renal columns then divide the medulla into individual compartments. And we can see these individual compartments have a big broad base and then come up to an apex, kind of like a cone or what they also thought was somewhat pyramid shaped, which is why the medullary region uh, forms what we call, or is formed, I should say, by what we call the renal pyramids or the medullary pyramids. So we have these medullary pyramids to them uh, that fill this space. The average kidney has somewhere between six and 18 of these in there. Renal Doritos, I like that, that is excellent, absolutely. Another characteristic that hopefully you notice, and again, this is just an illustration, but we'll look at a real one in just a second. Notice another key characteristic of the uh, medullary pyramids is that they have a very striped appearance to them. As we are going to see, they have a massive number of tubules in them and all the tubules are almost all parallel to each other. So even with the naked eye, as we look at this tissue, it has a very striped appearance because of that massive amount of tubules that are filling the space of these uh, medullary pyramids. So they have these grooves or striations on them. They, of course, come to an apex and that apex basically forms a finger-like structure that sticks out. And that apex is known as the renal papillae. And it is from these papillae that the urine is released. And in fact, once it is released from the papillae into these tube-like structures, it is indeed now called urine. While it's up here in the nephrons, while it's in the pyramids, we, while we're processing it, it is known as filtrate. So it's filtrate while it is processed. But once processed, it becomes urine. And it is urine that is expressed from the papillae. Notice it is released into that centrally located space. Oh, I should do that too. Uh, centrally located space, that is the sinus. All right, now one last thing. If you look, and let's change colors again, I'll grab a black pen this time. Black and make it a little, that's good size. So it, a individual pyramid plus the cortex above it and the column that surrounds it, this unit that we have here is what we consider a lobe of the kidney. And if the average kidney has between six and 18 pyramids, how many lobes does the average kidney have? 
Same number. Same number, exactly. Six to 18 lobes. So a lobe is the pyramid, the cortex, and the bit of renal column that surrounds it. All right, now, as I mentioned, our papillae are going to express the urine into the space that is the renal sinus. However, we don't want it just freely flowing into the sinus onto the floor. Instead, we want to collect that urine and we collect it by these tubes that are located inside of the sinus. And these tubes are what are known as the calluses. Calluses is the plural. The singular is calyx. So calyx is the singular. And calluses is the plural. And calluses come in one of two flavors, minor or major calluses. A minor calyx is one oops, that receives urine from only one uh, papillae. Whereas a major calyx receives urine from two or more papillae. So for instance, if we look at this illustration, let's make dots. This one right here, is this a minor or a major calyx? Minor. Minor. Is this one a minor or a major calyx? Minor. These are the easy questions, folks. Excellent. Absolutely. But what about this one right here? Major. Major. And notice this one here would be a major. And this one here would be a major. All right. So all of the minors feed into the major calluses as they accumulate the urine. And then as they accumulate the urine, they are going to release that urine into a large funnel shaped structure. And this large funnel shaped structure is what is known as the renal pelvis. And it is the renal pelvis that carries the urine out of the kidney and then feeds the urine into the ureter. All right. Am I the one binging or is that someone else or am I just hearing that? It's just me. All righty. Questions on that? So notice, again, the sinus is the space, and that space is lined by the fibrous capsule. But within that space, we have the tubes. Those are the minor and major calluses that form together into the pelvis. Blood vessels and nerves are going to be located in the space, and then the space is packed for protection with adipose. All right. Questions on that? We've looked at the illustrations, and they do a nice job of showing this, but here we actually see the pretty picture that does a good job of showing this as well, where we actually are looking at a real live kidney. Now this kidney happens to be a pig kidney, not a human, but it still shows us the same general idea. We have that granule cortex. We have the columns that we can see a little bit of. We see the pyramids with their striations. 
we see the minor and major calluses that feed into the pelvis and then feed out into the ureter. We see some large blood vessels coming into the space of the sinus. And like we talked about, a lobe is a pyramid and the cortex and column that surrounds it. All right, questions on that. All right, so obviously the kidney is not something we voluntarily control, right? But it is supplies, uh, there is a elaborate neural control of the kidney, primarily from the autonomic nervous system. And which branch of the autonomic nervous system is responsible for primarily controlling the kidney? Celiac um, ganglia, no? True, but I was thinking more of the branches, sympathetic versus parasympathetic, right? Parasympathetic, absolutely, right? Because as we know, uh, producing urine, right? We've got those two processes, fight and flight of the sympathetic and rest and digest, housekeeping. And making, filtering the blood definitely sounds like a housekeeping process, doesn't it? Absolutely. And so that's why, of course, it is only controlled by the sympathetic nervous system primarily. Wait, what? I thought <laughs> we said parasympathetic. Nope. As it turns out, it is actually the sympathetic nervous system that primarily controls the kidney. We will explain the why in a little bit, but here's the key. Um, as to what it is. As we've already talked about, how vital is it that your kidneys filter your blood? Very vital. Yeah, vitally vital. Absolutely. It is vitally vital, very vital that it absolutely does that, right? So do you think we really need our parasympathetic nervous system cheering it on saying, come on, kidney, you can do it? No, no we want the default setting of the kidney to be filter the blood all the time. And in fact, while you're sitting here calmly in class, like we talked about, 25% of your blood is going to your kidneys. That is a massive volume of blood. And when there's a lot of blood in an area, what else do we know? Now, it's not why someone pees themselves when they're really scared, although that is an excellent question. There's a massive amount of blood. And when there's a large volume of blood, what else do you have when you have a large volume of blood? Large pressure. Exactly. Massive volume of blood. And that massive volume of blood produces a large pressure. That pre blood pressure is, we'll see, is vital for the function of the kidney. Okay, I think that hopefully makes some semblance of sense. But now let's think about it. I call a 15 minute break and you decide to run outside your door, run across the street to Starbucks and then run back. While you're running around the house or downstairs or to Starbucks, so when active, do we still have 25% of our blood going to our kidneys at that point? No, more. More going to our kidneys when we're when we're active? Or are we sending kidney, are we sending the blood to places like the muscles, like the lungs, like the heart, so that I can be physically active? So when active, we have less blood going to the kidneys. And if we have less blood going to the kidneys, that means that the blood pressure will drop. And if the blood pressure drops, a drop in blood pressure could affect the function of the kidney. So when we're active, 
And of course, when we're active, we're using our sympathetic nervous system. Our sympathetic nervous system job is to increase pressure in the kidney so that it can still function normally, even with less blood. All right. We will explain this mechanism and this process in more detail later. But here is it in a nutshell. I know it doesn't seem intuitive that it should be the sympathetic nervous system that controls the kidney because filtering the blood definitely sounds like a housekeeping type of process, which normally our parasympathetic does. But it turns out that filtering the blood is so vitally important that uh, to do it properly, we have to have high blood pressure. And when we're active, less blood goes to the kidney and our pressure could drop and our kidneys could stop functioning as efficiently. And that'd be a bad thing. So when we're active, when we're using our sympathetic nervous system, our sympathetic nervous system needs to target the kidney, increase the pressure so it can continue to function normally, even with less blood. Can I ask you? Yes. Uh, why it's uh, less blood? go to kidneys when you're active the blood still needs to be filtered true it does it does still need to be filtered but what you have to remember is do you have enough blood in your body to send all areas of your body the mass the most amount of, of blood that it would need for whatever its function would be no no so what happens is when we're doing ac different activities, we have to redistribute the blood to different parts of our body, right? When we are eating a big meal, we send more blood to our digestive system. When we are exercising, we send more blood to our muscles, right? That's something we've talked about a lot in this class. We haven't thought of the flip side of that. If I'm sending more blood to my digestive system or if I'm sending more blood to my muscles, then that must mean that I'm sending less blood to other places. And those kidneys are one of those other places. When you're active, we need to send more muscle, uh, more blood to the muscles. And if we're sending more blood to the muscles, that means less for the kidneys. When blood goes to other places, so it's filtered out there? No, it still gets filtered out just in the kidneys. So the kidneys are still what's filtering them. It still has to ultimately get to the kidneys to be filtered, but less blood is directed in that direction. So we need to keep it going. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and the sympathetic keeps the pressure up when active, so it can still filter the blood that's going to it. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. Yep. All right, excellent. Perfect, all right, let's go ahead and delete that. Uh, as you mentioned, though, also, yes, those nerves do come off of the celiac plexus. And again, our goal is to regulate that renal blood flow. How much blood goes to the kidney determines how much we're able to filter the blood and also how much urine is going to be formed. As I said, at rest, 25% of your blood is being sent to the kidney. As a result of that, we are filtering massive amounts of blood during the course of a day. You produce 200 liters of filtrate from your blood in a 24 hour period of time. Now, do you produce 200 liters of urine? While you produce 200 liters of filtrate, does that 200 liters then leave your body? No, of course not, for two very important reasons. Reason one is you don't have 200 liters of extra fluid in your body you can afford to get rid of. And the second important reason is if we produce 200 liters of urine during the course of the day, we'd all be sitting in the bathroom for this lecture. All right. So while 200 liters of filtrate is filtered out of the blood, over 99% of that is reabsorbed into the body. So we only produce about one to two liters of urine in a day. So this requires a massive blood supply, a very elaborate blood supply to our kidney to be able to maintain this. 
Do I have the pretty picture first? Yes, I do. Excellent. Well, actually, it's got some words on it. So we can start here. All right. This is going to take a bit of work. It's a teeny bit early, but I do want to definitely take some time to talk about and go over this together. So let's do this fresh. Even though it's a little bit early, we'll go ahead and take our first break. It is 1255. So let's restart at 110. So 110, we will restart. And I will start the recording at that part. All right, any questions on that before we take our first break? All right, excellent. I will see you guys in 15 minutes. So let's start by drawing our kidney. And then we'll draw, I'm just gonna draw a couple pyramids in here. Well, actually let's do the sinus first. Alrighty, so our goal now is going to be to talk about the blood supply of the kidney. Now, where does the blood going to the kidney first come from? If you were to start at the heart and I were to ask you for driving directions to the kidney, which I most certainly could do because it's material you're responsible for in this class. And this class is cumulative. Excellent. So ascending aorta, which takes us where? Aortic arch, which takes us where? Thoracic aorta. Excellent. Then someone mentioned the abdominal aorta. And from the abdominal aorta, how does the kidney get its blood? The renal artery. Renal artery, excellent. So this would start with the renal artery. The renal artery, of course, is a singular structure that travels off of the abdominal aorta that takes the blood towards the kidney, but not actually to the kidney. Before the renal artery reaches the kidney, it actually splits. And it splits into blood vessels called the segmental arteries. And it is the segmental arteries that branch to enter into the kidney. If you think about it, this is a little bit about what we saw in the uh, respiratory system. The primary bronchi comes off of the trachea, but it branches before it actually reaches the lungs. And it is the secondary ones that enter the lobes. So here we have our segmental arteries. These segmental arteries, and I guess we can write this here. We just got to keep it a little smaller now. Make sure it all fits. Oh, no, not there. That one I wanted to be. 24. Actually, you know what? I'm not going to bother going back and forth. It's going to be a pain. So let's just do this. We'll just put SA there for segmental arteries. These segmental arteries then continue to branch. And as they continue to branch, they branch into blood vessels that go through the renal columns. Now, remember the renal columns, especially down the center here, is basically part of the lobe. So notice if you think about it, we would have a lobe here and we would have a lobe here. So this new blood vessel would go between the lobes. And so it is named the interlobar artery. So 
So the interlobar art artery that we will call IL. travels through the renal columns between the lobules, between the lobes. This blood vessel then branches, and as it branches, it basically arcs over the top of the pyramid. As it arcs over the top of the pyramid, it basically defines the border between the cortex and the pyramid. This blood vessel that arcs over the top of the base of our pyramid is called the arcuate artery. Because it arcs over the top of the uh, pyramid. And like I said, helps to define the boundary between the cortex and the pyramid. So this is our arcuate artery. that. Then what we have, uh, let's move this, sorry, got stuff in my way. Um, smaller blood vessels that branch off of the arcuate and go into the cortex. These branches that basically radiate off the arcuate artery and go into the cortex are called the cortical radiate arteries. Now, you may see some older texts where they are also referred to as the inter- lobular arteries because they individualize the individual lobules within a lobe. But I think that even anatomists decided that interlobar and interlobular were too confusing. And so they have changed it to cortical radiate. I would prefer cortical radiate, but interlobular is a appropriate anatomical term. And quite frankly, it's fun to say. Uh, so since it's fun to say, you are welcome to use it because again, it is an appropriate anatomical term. And then lastly, coming off of this are going to be small, tiny arteries that feed into special capillaries. And of course, a blood vessel that feeds into a capillary is an arteriole. And this one feeds inward, so it is the afferent arterial. Afferent arterial. Excellent. This afferent arterial brings us to what right now we will refer to as our magical black box. This magical black box is our nephron. The nephron, like I said, are the structural or the functional units of the kidney. Each kidney has something like a half million of these or something crazy like that. They're these super important, very vitally uh, uh, important structures and their job is to filter and process the blood. Now, of course, when the blood leaves all of the special capillaries in this, it is, of course, going to feed into, uh, capillaries feed into what again? They're fed into by the arterioles and they're fed out into what? Venules. Venules. Excellent, and so it is gonna be the venule that feeds out of this. So in our pathway of blood, we have been traveling down to the nephron, into the nephron, and then out of the nephron into a venule. In our book, it says uh, efferent arterial. We're getting there. Oh, okay. All righty, excellent. So 
we have not talked about all of the anatomy yet, but one of the things that we need to talk about for our nephron is our nephron contains not one, but two and a half capillaries. So there are two and a half capillaries that are located inside of these. One of them is a highly specialized, highly modified capillary known as the glomerulus. Again, we'll talk about all the function of these. We'll talk about the anatomies of these in much more detail later. And in fact, the afferent arteriole is called the afferent arteriole because it is afferent to the glomerulus. It feeds into the glomerulus. The glomerulus, on the other hand, again, not only is it a highly specialized capillary in many ways, but one of the ways that it is highly specialized is that it is fed into by an arteriole and it is fed out of by an arteriole. So coming out of the glomerulus, it feeds into a blood vessel called the efferent arteriole. Go. That efferent arteriole's job is to then feed into a second capillary. And that second capillary wraps around all the tubules that are here in our kidney. So not surprisingly, it is called the peritubular capillary. And that peritubular capillary then feeds out into the venules. So the efferent arteriole, to answer your question, is considered a part of the nephron, whereas the afferent arteriole is not. All right. So we have all these mystical, magical blood vessels inside the glomerulus, the efferent arteriole, and the paratubular capillaries. We'll talk about their functions in just a bit. But what we know is that coming out of them, we have a venule. So let's put a big N here to remind us that that's our nephron. And then we have this arteriole that feeds out. And then the good news in, like many of the arteries and veins we've seen in the body, there is symmetry between the arteries coming in and the veins coming out. So these venules, feed into all of these veins that radiate out of the cortex towards the border of the medulla. And guess what we would call these, oops, gotta go back a step. This here is our cortical radiant arteries. Oops. And guess what we would call these blood vessels that are now feeding out? of the cortex towards the medulla. So again, the venules feed into these blood vessels that, there you go, cortical radiant veins, excellent. Excellent. Or guess what else they might be called? lobular veins. These feed into a vein that drapes over the top of the base of the pyramid, forming the boundary between the pyramid uh, and the cortex. And what might that blood vessel be called? Arcuate vein. Excellent that our cuit vein feeds into a blood vessel that travels through the columns between the pyramids. Guess what that would be called? Interlobar vein. And guess what the interlobar vein feeds into? Bingo, there you go, it feeds into the renal vein. Alex stole my thunder and my fun, absolutely. It turns out there is no such thing as a segmental vein. 
Instead, what happens is all of the interlobar veins come together and they form the renal vein. And of course, the renal vein feeds into what? All right, this started over here at the abdominal aorta, aorta, aorta. And it ends at the inferior vena cava. Perfect. And there you go. Just that simply, just that beautifully, we see the specialized blood flow of a drop of blood through our kidney. And really, from the heart to the kidney and back, we could trace that whole path if we needed to. Now, as always, I've done a truly amazing job of showing this, but let's go ahead and take a look at the pretty pictures from your textbook that show the exact same thing. Notice again here, we can follow and trace the path, that renal artery before it enters branches to form the segmental arteries, the segmental arteries branch to form the interlobar arteries that go between the pyramids those branch to form the arcuate arteries that arc over the top of the pyramid, forming the boundary between the pyramid and the cortex. And then we have these blood vessels that radiate out from the uh, arcuate into the cortex. Those are the cortical radiant arteries. They feed into tiny little afferent arterioles. And those afferent arterioles are gonna feed into our nephron. Our nephron is made up of two and a half capillaries. The first is a highly specialized capillary known as the glomerulus. That glomerulus, one of the ways it's special is it's fed into by an arteriole and out of by an arteriole. So it is the afferent arteriole that feeds into it and the efferent arteriole that feeds out of it. It feeds into a more um, typical capillary called the paratubular capillary, which then feeds into a venule. That venule then feeds into the cortical radiant veins, which feed into the arcuate veins, which feed into the interlobar veins. And even though the interlobar veins fuse together into structures that could easily be called segmental veins, if we've learned nothing, it's that anatomists hate us, so no such thing exists. Instead, all of these interlobar veins feed into the renal vein and out. Questions on that? All right, excellent. Let's talk about the nephrons. Like I said, they are the structural and functional units of the kidney. Each kidney has over a million of them. At least that's what they claim. I haven't counted them, so I don't know. If you were to take all of the tubules out of all of the nephrons in a kidney and lay them out in a row, it would hurt a lot. And like we said, it is these nephrons that are responsible for forming our urine but remember, urine isn't what we care about. What we care about is that it is filtering the blood. Right? Our goal is to filter the blood. Right? If a doctor doesn't know what's wrong with you, what's one of the first thing he has you do? Check your urine. Exactly, pee in a cup right, to check your urine, because what's coming out of your blood tells us, the doctor, a lot about what's going on inside of your body. So remember, the goal isn't to make urine, the goal is to filter the blood, and then anything that doesn't belong ends up in the urine. So again, its job is to remove wastes, regulate the condition of the blood. And to do this, our nephron basically has to be made up of 
two types of structures. It has to be made up of blood vessels. We know there's an efferent arteriole in there and two and a half uh, capillaries. But there's also got to be those miles and miles of renal tubules as well. So let's look at the pretty picture here from your textbook. And then we'll take an opportunity to draw this ourselves and try to make some sense of this. All right. So here's the pretty picture from your textbook, but let's go to our whiteboard and do it for ourselves. Any questions on this before we get started? Any questions on the blood supply before we move on to our next big topic? All right, excellent. So, our nephron is comprised of two different types of structures. The first type of structure are the renal tubules. And conveniently enough, there are basically four main ones that we need to talk about. It is also comprised of blood vessels. And as you've seen from us listing before, there are gonna be basically four uh, main ones of those, or really three and a half, depending on how you count. When talking about a nephron, one of the main components of a nephron, and in fact, those of you who took me for 430, this was the very first histology thing you ever saw, was a structure by the name of a renal corpuscle. A renal corpuscle is, has three components. The first of these components is that blood vessel we mentioned, our glomerulus. That glomerulus, as I mentioned, is a highly specialized capillary. And so for starters, we will just simply draw it as a squiggly line. And of course, let's change to pink real fast. We know that it is fed into by the afferent arteriole. But remember, the afferent arteriole is not a part of the nephron. So that's why I made it pink, because it doesn't count. It's not a part of the nephron. So part one is our glomerulus. Its job is to produce filtrate. So what's going to end up happening is we are going to get those 200 liters of filtrate that we talked about are going to be released. Now let's use orange. Are going to be released from this capillary. Now, of course, if I'm going to release 200 liters of stuff from this capillary, then I need something to catch that with. And that structure, I don't like the orange. That, oh, let's use blue for this. That structure we're going to use to catch that filtrate is, with is a structure that is known as Bowman's capsule. Of course, why is it called Bowman's capsule? Good old Bob Bowman, exactly. It was the first one who identified it and described it. It is also sometimes known as uh, the renal capsule. Oops. But I can think that gets too confusing with the um, 
the fibrous capsule that's on the outer surface of it. So uh, I think that the Bowman's capsule is something that is a little bit easier for me to remember, but it's sometimes called, or, the, or actually uh, the other thing it's called, not so much the renal capsule, sorry, the glomerular capsule. Glomerular capsule, thank you, Alex, is the other name for it, absolutely. The glomerular capsule is also an acceptable name for this as well. However, we always want to be more specific, and more specifically, this is the parietal layer of Bowman's capsule. When I use that term parietal layer, what does that remind you of? Parietal um, membranes. Right, parietal serous membranes. They line the cavities or they form the spaces. And that's what this one here is doing. It is forming the space. Because as it turns out, there is also a visceral layer. That visceral layer is a highly specialized type of cell called a podocyte. And these podocytes, and let's make this light blue in color, are these fancy cells, and I'll just draw them as a squiggly line, that are going to wrap around the glomerulus. So those podocytes is the visceral layer, and Bowman's capsule is the parietal layer. Now, this just needs to be a cup for catching fluid. And I have to pack a million of these into my kidney. So when I'm using tissue to make this cup, am I going to want to use some type of stratified tissue or even a simple columnar tissue? What type of tissue am I going to want to use to make this Bowman's capsule? Simple squamous? Yeah, exactly. It is going to be a simple squamous epithelial tissue that we are going to use to make that. Notice again, our visceral layer is those podocytes. So it isn't any kind of epithelial tissue that way. It's special cells. But that parietal layer is um, Bowman's capsule. Now, remember my renal corpuscle I said were three components. Component one is the glomerulus. Component two is Bowman's capsule, or let's be more specific, parietal layer. And the third part is the space in between the two. There you go, exactly, Alex. The third is the space in between the two, the space for collecting the fluid, and that space is called Bowman space. There you go. So those three things together form our renal corpuscle. The glomerulus, our first blood vessel, our Bowman's capsule, our first renal tubule, and then the space in between them. All right. And like I said, in this space, we are producing 200 liters of filtrate. So obviously a tremendous amount of processing needs to take place. That processing begins Sorry, hold on. There we go, that's what I want. That processing begins in this big, windy, twisty, nope. Twisty, turby tubule that wraps around and around and around and around. This tubule happens to be closest to the renal corpuscle. So it is referred to as proximal.
it is twisty and turny, right? Like the uh, plot in Lost. So it is convoluted. And again, it is a tubule. So this is the proximal convoluted tubule. This proximal convoluted tubule is where the majority of the processing takes place. We see that in the specialization of the tissue. In this region, the tissue is going to be a simple uh, cuboidal epithelial tissue with a massive amount of mitochondria because there's going to be a lot of active processing that is going to take place. And we want to dramatically increase the surface area. So how would we dramatically increase the surface area so that a lot of processing could take place in here? Microvilli, massive microvilli. Excellent. And so that is here in our proximal convoluted tubule. But then our tubule does something interesting. That interesting thing that it does is it stops getting all twisty and turny, and it actually dramatically descends deep into the uh, kidney. In fact, this extension of the tubule can actually go into the medullary pyramid. It then takes a rapid hairpin turn and comes back up again. So instead of being all twisty and turny, we get this uh, a, a dramatic uh, hairpin extension of our tubule. And this is called what? Nephron loop. There you go, nephron loop, or it's also called the loop of Henley. Don't, you know, don't leave poor Henley out of this, but yes, it's also known as the nephron loop. You don't, uh, if you feel uh, bad about Bob Henley, given his name on it, then yes, you may call it the nephron loop. The nephron loop has two parts. Uh, the first part is the part that goes down and that is the descending limb. And the part coming up then would be the ascending limb. There you go, Alex, jumping ahead of me, absolutely. This descending and ascending limb, though, have different anatomies to them. The descending limb is made up of simple squamous epithelial tissues. And because it is a simple squamous epithelial tissue, it is referred to as the descending thin limb whereas the ascending limb is comprised of um, simple cuboidal epithelial cells. And so as a result of that is known as the ascending thick limb. And if these two limbs are made up of different types of epithelial tissues, do you think they have different functions? Absolutely, they are. Now, once it ascends again, it then goes back to yet another twisty and turny component. This is another convoluted tubule, but this one is much farther from the renal corpuscle. So not surprisingly, it is called the prox uh, pardon me, the distal convoluted tubule. Like the proximal, it is going to be comprised of simple cuboidal epithelial tissues. In, in fact, it's, it's very similar as the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henley. 
Oh, let's say it's say essentially, let's say it's very similar. Let's do it that way. And the distal convoluted tubule is where just the fine tuning of the filtrate, the fine tuning of the blood takes place, right? So again, it's processing just like the proximal convoluted tubule, but it is more fine tuning, not as much work is done here. So there are gonna be fewer mitochondria and there are going to be uh, smaller, uh, less significant microvilli. Now, this distal convoluted tubule is going to feed into a structure. And that structure is what is known as the collecting duct. So our distal convoluted tubule feeds into the collecting duct. The collecting duct can still process the filtrate, but it is not a part of the nephron. So there still can be a little bit of processing that takes place there in our collecting duct, but the collecting duct is not a part of the nephron, just like the afferent arteriole is not a part of the nephron. And it is the collecting duct that then expresses the filtrate out the papilla and the after, oops, papilla, and after it does that, the filtrate becomes urine or becomes. All right. For anatomy purposes, our collecting duct is also simple cuboidal. And as we'll see, there are primarily two types of cells. But again, we'll talk about that when we get there in more depth. Questions on that? Excellent. We have identified all four tubular components of our nephron, given a basic idea of their function, although we didn't talk about the function of the loop of Henle. Anyone happen to know what the function of the loop of Henle is? Absolutely, it plays an important role in the absorption of sodium and water. So basically what that plays an important role in doing is maintaining blood volume and pressure and also concentrating or diluting our urine. Our urine. I don't know why I keep saying it that way. This is where we're gonna concentrate or dilute the urine. So there you go. We've identified the tubular structures. We've identified the anatomy of our tubular structures. We have identified the general function. Obviously we're gonna talk in much more depth, but that is a good starting point. Let's do the same thing for the blood vessel structures. Again, our glomerulus is that highly specialized capillary. And again, this is where we produce, or let's say release, those 200 liters of filtrate to be processed. The blood that remains in our capillary after the capillary exchange, comes out into, of course, our efferent arteriole. Mm 
Again, it receives the blood from the glomerulus. But after all, it is still an arteriole. So the job of an arteriole is to feed blood into the capillary. Like all, all arterioles. And the capillary it is going to feed it into is one that is draped over the entire nephron. And that blood vessel that is draped over the entire nephron is the peri tubular capillary. So that paratubular capillary, do, do, do. We'll just draw as this big crisscrossing capillary structure over the top of the, there we go. And there we go. Make a big elaborate capillary bed. And then as we know, it has, oops. Mm. Let's cheat and do this down here. That venule coming out. And if you think about it, in this venule, we now have our clean blood. And of course, coming out of our collecting duct, we have at the end of it, our urine. So notice we had dirty blood enter. So dirty blood entered in the afferent arteriole, clean blood leaves out the venule. Notice one last thing. As I mentioned, our glomerulus is a one-way capillary. Fluid only moves out. All right, so again, that would be an example of filtration, as we know. Whereas our paratubular capillary is much more of a typical capillary. It is fed into by an arteriole, fed out of into a venule. And it also allows for two-way movement of water and materials, both in and out. So we would have both filtration and reabsorption in that paratubular capillary. All right. Questions on that? All right, now notice one thing with my paratubular capillary, I didn't draw it over the loop of Henle. Can the paratubular capillary go over the loop of Henle? Yeah, sure, absolutely, of course it can. However, there are some special very long loops of Henle. And those very special, very long loops of Henle have a special capillary associated with them. This capillary is kind of like an extension of the paratubular capillary. So we could call it a fourth blood vessel, but we could also kind of call it 3B. 3B is a specialized blood vessel known as the vasa recta. This vasa recta is a 
straight draping capillary only found on very long loops of Henle. And so we can draw it here as this kind of drapey down, kind of like lattice work or lace type or ladder type capillary that is located here. And of course, it will also feed into a venue. Whoops, too far. So that's why I kept saying two and a half capillaries because not every nephron has this vasorectal. rectum. The vasorectal rectum is only found on very special nephrons that we'll give a fancy name to that have a very, very long loop of Henle. All right. Now, again, as always, I've done a truly amazing job of drawing this. Please don't get up and applaud. You're embarrassing me. But let's take a look at the pretty picture from your textbook that shows the exact same thing. Notice again, here we have our renal corpuscle comprised of three components, our glomerulus, the parietal layer of Bowman's capsule, and the space in between. Notice that parietal layer, and actually let me use my highlighter for this. I know you guys can see my mouse, but I like the highlighter. That parietal layer of Bowman's capsule is just a boundary. So it is a simple squamous epithelial tissue. Whereas on the surface of the capillary, we have these highly specialized cells called podocytes. They're called podocytes because they have these long foot-like processes that look like little feet. Pod, of course, means foot. So these special podocytes line the surface of the glomerulus. This Bowman's capsule feeds into the proximal convoluted tubule, twisty and turny. Cuboidal cells with a massive amount of mitochondria and a massive amount of extensive microvilla. It feeds into the thin descending limb of the loop of Henle, which is made up of simple squamous cells, which feeds into the thick ascending limb and the distal convoluted tubule, both of which are also cuboidal cells, but with fewer mitochondria and fewer microvilla. This distal convoluted tubule feeds into the collecting duct. And as I mentioned, the collecting duct has two different types of cells, intercalated cells and principal cells, both of which are cuboidal. But remember, the collecting duct is not a part of the nephron. Our blood vessel supply involves the three capillary beds we know now, our glomerular capillaries, part of the renal corpuscle. Here, like I said, is that renal corpuscle we can see, and let's actually use the highlighter now. We can see here this big elaborate twisted knot is the glomerulus. Here we can see the simple squamous epithelial cells that are forming Bowman's capsule. And the clear white space in between is that Bowman space. So these three things together make the renal corpuscle. That glomerulus is a highly specialized capillary. It is fed into and out of by arteries, arterioles. It is high pressure for a capillary. It is a fenestrated capillary. Someone remind me what fenestrated means again? There's holes in it. Yeah, it has holes in it. And it has one way moving of materials. Materials just move out. It only filters the blood. That feeds into our efferent arteriole, which feeds into our second capillary. 
Here we see our second capillary over the top of the proximal and the distal convoluted tubules, known as the paratubular capillary. That paratubular capillary uh, is a more traditional capillary, low pressure, fed into by an arteriole, fed out of by a venule, and allows two-way movements, both filtration and reabsorption. But remember, we mentioned that there are some nephrons that have a massively long loop of Henle. And if you have this massively long loop of Henle, they can have this lattice-like or ladder-like lacing specialized capillary over that long loop of Henle, known as the vasorectum. Now, I want to emphasize an important point about this picture. Notice with this picture, they have shown the vasa recta and the paratubular capillary is completely separate. But in reality, can a, can a nephron like this have a paratubular capillary on it? Yes, absolutely. It's not like you have a vasa recta or a paratubular capillary. You can have both. And if you don't have a vasa recta, does that mean there's going to be nothing on your loop of Henle? No the paratubular capillary will cover that small loop of Henle as well. So remember, they're just really trying to emphasize and illustrate the difference in these two capillaries with this picture. In reality, and we'll see that in a second here, I'll show you that, come back, yeah, what's the picture that I wanted? Here we go. So here we see a, you know, one that has a paratubular capillary over the entire thing, including the loop of Henle. And here we see the vasa recta and a paratubular capillary as well. So they are not truly separate and distinct from each other. I love some of the pictures from your textbook and this is absolutely one of my favorites, probably because it's the kidney, but it looks like tiny little brains. So that may be why I like this so much. But what you can see very, very nicely is what they've done here is using an electron microscope, they have been able to isolate and show all of the blood vessels that we were just talking about. Notice if we use our highlighter here, here is our cortical radiant artery, bringing the blood up. From that cortical radiant artery, we then have the afferent arterioles and those afferent arterioles are feeding into these tightly packed capillaries. These capillaries are tightly packed and look like brains because they're held inside Bowman's capsule. So they're these tight, packed, compact capillaries that are the glomeruli. Notice that glomerulus then feeds out into an efferent arteriole that feeds into these very loose capillaries. These loose capillaries are so loose because remember they're wrapping around the tubules. They're forming around the spaces of the tubules. So instead of being packed in, they're draped over the top. So here we can see the glomerulus, the paratubular capillaries and the efferent arteriole between them. So this does a great job of showing those blood vessels, including the ones that aren't part of the nephron, the afferent arteriole, and our cortical radiant artery. So this shows this really, really nicely. Now, as I mentioned, there are over a million nephrons in each kidney, and there are two types. The traditional looking nephrons and the ones that have the big, huge, elaborate loops of Henle with the specialized vasa rectus. And so of course, if they have two types, you know they're gonna have two names. The typical capillary is what is known as a cortical capillary. They are by far the most common, making up about 85% of all the capillaries. I mean, pardon me, of all the nephrons. And one of the keys to these cortical nephrons is the cortical nephron, all of it, or all but a tiny bit of it is located in the cortex. So some of these nephrons will be entirely contained within the cortex. Some of them may dip down into the medulla a little bit, but the majority of them is in the cortex and these are the ones that have the small loops of Henle. The nephrons that have the long loops of Henle 
have loops of Henle that are so long, they may penetrate down to the end or most of the way down the, the medullary pyramid. So they drape very, very deep into the medulla, which is why they're the juxtamedullary nephrons. These play a much larger role with that large loop of Henle. Remember the loop of Henle we said is what helps us concentrate or dilute our urine to maintain blood volume and blood pressure. And these play a huge role in that. And again, I know 15% doesn't seem like a lot, but remember when you have a million of these, what's 15% of a million? That's right, it's a lot. So there are a ton of these, and so they play a very important role in concentrating or diluting our urine. And these are those juxtamedullary nephrons. And it is only the juxtamedullary nephrons that will have those vasa rectus along them. And we see that in the pretty pictures as well. Here's our cortical one with just a paratubular capillary. Here is our juxtamedullary nephron with a, a paratubular capillary and that draping vasa recta as well. All right, questions on that? So, uh, again, the longer, more extensive loop of Henleys are going to play a much more prominent role in either diluting or concentrating our urine. So basically affecting the osmolarity of our urine. How much water do we pull back? How much water do we let go? So obviously that is going to directly affect our blood volume. And as we know, as we affect blood volume, it will also uh, uh, indirectly, excuse me, it will indirectly affect our blood pressure. So these are the ones that can affect our blood volume. These are the ones that can affect our blood pressure. These are the ones that can concentrate our urine when we need to hold on to that water. All right. Questions on that? All right. I want to talk some more anatomy. I want to talk some more histology on this uh, before we go any further. But before we do that, I think this is a good point for our second break. So let's go ahead and take our second break and then we'll remind ourselves of some of the resources and look at some of the histology involved in this. It is 217 right uh, pardon me, 27 right now. So we will restart at uh, whatever 15 minutes plus that is 22, 222. That's a good number, magical number. We will restart at 222. And then I will start the recording at that time. Apparently I need a quick power down. All right. Any questions on any of that? All right. I'll meet you back here in 15 minutes. All righty. Let's go ahead and get started. So again, I want to sum up this anatomy that we've been talking about, both the gross and microscopic anatomy of the uh, kidney. Uh, we've been talking about oops, wrong button. Uh, the nephron and the glomerulus, the renal corpuscle. Here, we've got this great picture from your textbook that does a really nice job of showing us this anatomy. Notice again, we have that simple squamous epithelial tissue. The cell is so flat, the nucleus kind of bulges out on the side forming that cup that is going to collect. That is that parietal layer of Bowman's capsule. And here on the glomerulus, we have those specialized cells called the podocytes with a big centrally located cell body and nucleus. And then all these processes and all these processes have these little uh, foot-like extensions that stick out interwoven with each other, forming these filtration slits. Notice also they peeled away the podocytes in one location and we can see, as I mentioned, this is a fenestrated capillary, a capillary with those bigger holes to allow for more material to come out. 
And I know when you look at these potocytes, they're like super trippy looking. You're like, there's no way it could really look like that. That's just some kind of artistic uh, representation of it. But here is, granted, a colorized uh, electron microscopy view. But here with the electron microscope, we can actually see that this really is what those potocytes look like. So there is very, very uh, dramatic, uh, extensive, elaborate look to these potocytes with those big, elaborate foot-like processes. All right. That also brings me to some of the other resources you should be using. Uh, again, like in the respiratory system, actually more so than the respiratory system, there is more histology on this one. There's a lot of histology. And the good news, as always, is usually there are distinct characteristics that help us to tell the histology apart. So once you know that key one or two concepts to look for, it can make it super easy to identify what you're looking at. But you got to get used to seeing those things and there's no easy way to do it. It takes time, it takes practice. You should have a good histology atlas, uh, again, to help you to be successful. But the other thing, remember, that can help you to be successful on this is to take advantage of the resources that have been provided for you. Again, if we look, and where do I wanna go? I wanna go here. If we go to our class site, again, on our class site, we have these study tools, and these study tools provide you with a lot of great resources that can help you to be uh, successful. Uh, but two of the key ones that I really, really like are the CRC Virtual Anatomy Lab. Uh, their histology isn't always the best, but what's great about it is they've taken pictures of many of the models that they have at Kasumnas River College. And since we're in the same school district, we have many of those exact same models. And so we'll, we use them as well. And so these are things that normally you would have in the classroom to study for them. Uh, again, we are working on putting our bank together. We have more resources, but it is a slow process. And so why not take advantage of theirs? And the other one that's really helpful, especially for the histology, if you haven't looked at this site yet, then first and foremost, shame on you. Uh, but this Yale site is truly, truly amazing. So notice if we go to, let's clear that. Here is that Kasumnas River College Virtual Anatomy Lab, and it's got all organ systems, including the urinary system. Notice when we go to our urinary model and chart, what they've done is done a nice job of showing us the illustrations. And then from here, uh, both labeled and unlabeled. And again, they've labeled what they think is insignificant and important on this. And then certainly these are things that can be seen uh, for us. Again, they won't necessarily label everything that I am interested in. And they may have some things labeled that I'm not interested in, but still you should get a good sense of the material and you can use these resources. There are some uh, fun little models that do a good job. Notice here we see the uh, abdominal aorta, we see the renal artery, we see the renal vein, the inferior vena cava, we see the adrenal gland, the ureter, and those kind of things, and again, the anatomy there. The internal anatomy on this is okay. Uh, same thing with this one here where it's okay. But where I think it get this one's getting better, but where I think it's best is actually in this great plaque. This is one view of a three uh, piece plaque that has three different models on them. Notice this does an excellent job of showing the gross anatomy. We can clearly see the cortex. We can clearly see the pyramids. We can clearly see the sinus. In that sinus, we can see the minor and major calluses. We can see the renal pelvis. We can see all of those components. This one also does a great job of showing all of the blood vessels that we've talked about as well. So we can clearly identify the interlobar, the arcuate, cortical radiant uh, for the arteries. Veins are up here, same way. And notice we can actually see off of that cortical radiant uh, artery, there are all of our renal corpuscles. They've even shown us some tubules here for what's clearly a juxtamedullary nephron because it's sewing so deep into the pyramid. But what they've also done on the second piece, and I think they've got a couple, is they've taken a chunk out of that. And again, notice when we're looking at our model here, we can see the arcuate artery and the arcuate veins. So they're forming the boundary between the cortex and the medulla. The medulla is striped. The cortex is more granular in appearance. Here we have that cortical radiant artery. 
which feeds into the afferent arteriole, feeding into a glomerulus, feeding out into an efferent arteriole, feeding into the paratubular capillaries. And notice they've shown the paratubular capillaries more elaborately here. And they even have a vasa recta, even though they don't have it on top of the loop of Henle, we can see that long draping blood vessel here. So they've done a nice job of showing the blood vessels separately uh, from the tubules. Notice we see Bowman's capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, same thing here. But notice this one's more short. This one's more superior in the uh, pyramid. That's annoying me, let's move that out of the way. And this one has a big, long, extensive loop of Henle that goes almost through the entire uh, medulla. So this would be that juxtamedullary nephron versus the cortical nephron. And notice both of them feed into that collecting duct, which comes down and feeds out, out the apex. So this does a really nice job of showing all of those. And notice they've got all the pretty labels. But the third component that is on this model is an up close view of our renal corpuscle. Here we see Bowman's capsule feeding into a proximal convoluted tubule. In fact, notice they've even done a nice job of showing us our microvilli on there for these cuboidal cells. Inside of it, we have our glomerulus. And notice our glomerulus on this side, they've left exposed and they've drawn the fenestrations on it to remind us that this is a fenestrated capillary. But notice on this side, they've left the podocytes in place. So we can see how there are those nice podocytes here forming the visceral layer of Bowman's capsule as opposed to the parietal layer. And of course, the space in between would be Bowman's space. So it shows that really nicely as well. When we get to the rest of the anatomy, there'll be things that it has there as well. As I mentioned, this has some histology, but it's not the best. But if you want the best, the best histology I have found for free online is this Yale site, Histology at Yale. It is truly, truly amazing. If, for instance, we go to the urinary system like we're doing now, it's got the lab where there are learning objectives. It has keywords and definitions and things like that that you can look at. There's this great pre-reading where it gives you introductions to the kidney, to the nephron, the corpuscles, all the things that we've just finished talking about. It has the pre-lab quizzes you can take, some other materials you can take advantage of. And then it has the histology slides. This is what we're really here for. In study mode, we can study the material and it'll have labels, but there's also a quiz mode where it will hide the labels and things along those lines. So notice when we look at the kidney, for instance, we can see uh, very nicely here that easy distinction between the cortex and the medulla. How do we know this is the cortex? Because the cortex is the only place you find the renal corpuscles. So notice renal corpuscles are only found in the cortex. So essentially we can really easily draw a line between the medulla, which is the part down here, nothing but tubules, and up here, all of the renal corpuscles. So we can see even on a low magnification, it's very easy to tell the cortex from the medulla, right? As we go through the different slides, Here we see a nice view. Uh, get rid of my drawing. Excellent. Again, here histologically, we see that uh, renal corpuscle. Here's that uh, parietal layer of Bowman's capsule. Oops. Go back to the high layer. That simple squamous epithelial tissue. Here's that elaborate capillary, that glomerulus. Here's the space in between. Awesome, this one actually has where you can see where that uh, Bowman's capsule connects to the proximal convoluted tubule and they go out that way. So some great material there. Notice also one of the things, and there's another one there, down, I don't care about that, I don't care about all the great electron microscopy views. So again, some of this stuff is really beautiful. There's more of those pot podocytes uncolorized. Here we actually look at that foot process. This is actually the filtration membrane we'll get to in just a minute. But what I wanted to show you was this right here. Notice when we look 
at the histology side and we are looking at the proximal convoluted tubule versus the distal convoluted tubule, they're both simple cuboidal epithelial tissues. So the key way to tell them apart is by looking in their lumens. The proximal convoluted tubule, remember, has very extensive microvilli. So when you look at those very extensive microvilli, uh, it, when you look in the lumen, it will look very dirty in its appearance. When you compare that to, oh, they don't have uh, the distal convoluted tubule. Notice the distal convoluted tubule doesn't have as much as much in it. Right there, here we see a much dirtier lumen. Uh, the proximal convoluted tubule is much more dirty in its lumen whereas the distal convoluted tube, and honestly, this isn't a great view of it, but there's some better ones that you'll be able to see, is gonna be much more clear in its appearance when you look at it uh, in that type of a view. I uh, don't care about that, don't care about that. So there are some great things. Oh, I know what I wanted to show you. Do, do, do. Well, let's go back to the first picture. Oh, hang on, let's cheapen this up, back to the kidney. One other thing that we can see histologically, oh, I know where I've got it. The other place that you can see these things, so these are all really, really excellent. But the other place where you can see this really nicely, again, in our modules, in our modules, I have actually got three histology pictures that I have provided to help. The first one that I want to point out is this one here. Again, it does a nice job of showing that boundary between the cortex where we have the renal corpuscles and the medulla. The other one I want to show you, we'll come back to this one in a second. Uh, but ooh, this one is a little bit better. Notice here, this one does a better job. See how clear that lumen is compared to how dirty this lumen is. So notice the ones in P are the proximal convoluted tubule, whereas the very clear ones the D are the distal convoluted tubules. So by looking at the lumen is the easiest way. And this is probably the best example. That's super clear. This is all cloudy. So that's an easy way to tell those apart. The last thing I want to show you, and I'll show it to you here, and then we'll go back to it on the Yale site, is that remember in the medullas, this is where we have all the tubules, all of those loops of Henle and all those collecting ducts and they all go in the same general direction. Remember, that's what gives our pyramid its stripes. So here we can see those stripes. Now, in looking at these tubules, is it possible to tell the difference between a proximal, I mean, before a thick ascending, uh, pardon me, a thin ascending limb, no, thick descending limb, uh, not enough sleep last night. Is it possible to tell the difference between a thin descending limb of the loop of Henle, a thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle, and a collecting duct? Yes. Am I going to hold you responsible for it? No. But what you can see in the medulla is while there are all those parallel tubules, the other thing remember that's in there are those special blood vessel capillaries that wrap around the loops of Henle. And these you can see, these dark concentrated regions within the medulla are those vasa rectus. In fact, if we go back to this kidney picture from the Yale histology site, notice, oops, I want my, that, it's not pink though. Right here, right here, right, right here. These dark segmented, dark stained regions are where those capillaries are wrapping around the tubules. Those are the vasa rectus. So even at a low magnification, we can see those vasa rectus within those more parallel tubules. And that's the other way you can tell the medulla from the cortex. Because of the proximal convoluted and distal convoluted, all the tubules are going any which way all over the place. And here, they're all very uh, uniform in their orientation. And notice too, sometimes being able to tell the proximal versus the distal convoluted tubule is even easier at a lower magnification. Notice at the lower magnification, let's go with that and let's go with that. Notice these here are very clear. Those are clearly gonna be uh, distal convoluted tubules. 
whereas these right here are very dirty, dark in their lumen. Those are proximal convoluted tubules. More distal, right? More proximal. So even at a lower magnification, in fact, sometimes in a lower magnification, it's easier to see those differences in the lumen that tell us the difference between the distal convoluted tubules like those there, and then the ones that are much, much darker that are the proximal convoluted tubules. And that's gonna be the main way you'll tell those apart. So make sure you are taking advantage of your resources to help you with this anatomy. All right? Questions on that? All righty, excellent. So we saw this with the electron microscope, but as I mentioned, where our filtration is going to take place in that renal corpuscle is here in our filtration membrane. This is where our urine formation begins. But again, this isn't where we're making the urine. It's not urine till we're done processing it. This is where we are producing those 200 liters of filtrate. We have that, again, thin, thin membrane made up of three parts. We have the, oops, this is gonna be way too big. The fenestrated, simple squamous epithelial tissue of, or endothelium, let's be more uh, epithelial tissue of the capillary, right? This is the tunica and timo or the endothelium would be what we would call that, absolutely. We have the foot-like processes of the uh, podocytes, which again are the visceral layer of Bowman's capsule. and basically a fused basement membrane that holds them together. That holds them together. And that's it. It's this very tiny, very thin membrane with big holes in it to make it really easy for filtering of material to take place. All right, questions on that? All right, there is one more anatomical feature we have to identify. Again, there are a million nephrons within each kidney. What that tells us is that much like the lungs, where we had all those alveoli, where we needed to be able to auto-regulate blood flow and airflow to those areas, so that we could maximize the efficiency of our gas exchange. Well, the same thing is here. We want to maximize the efficiency of every single nephron. This is not, wow, that was really bad. Oh, I know I did that. Oh, great. you get the idea. Of every single nephron. Clearly, this is not something we can do from a centralized location. So basically, each nephron has its own quality control. where it can monitor to make sure that it is producing the filtrate and processing the filtrate properly. Collectively, the cells that form this structure are gonna be associated with the renal corpuscle and their job is to make sure that we are producing filtrate at a proper rate so that that filtrate can be processed properly. 
Think of it in terms of the digestive system. Is the goal of the stomach to put the food into the small intestine as fast as it possibly can, as quickly as it possibly can? No, it wants to dole it out to the small intestine at a rate which allows the small intestine to maximize the processing. And the same thing is gonna be true here. Too much, too fast is, too, is bad, too slow is gonna be bad as well. And you are absolutely correct, Alex. This specialized collection of cells, oh, I don't know what's going on here, there we go, is known as the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Again, a nice big fancy term that you guaranteed you're gonna have to spell at some point or another. And this juxtaglomerular apparatus is comprised of three different types of cells. The first of these cells are what are known as the macula densa cells. Macula densa cells are actually located in the distal convoluted tubule. Let's actually change our view here for a second. So, here is our no, not Here's our Bowman's capsule. Out of that comes our proximal convoluted tubule into our loop of Henle and then our distal convoluted tubule. We know we have our afferent arteriole that feeds into our glomerulus and then out into the efferent arteriole. So this out here is our afferent arteriole. This here is our proximal convoluted tubule. This here is our loop of Henle. And this here is our distal convoluted tubule. And what kind of tissue type is our distal convoluted tubule again? Simple cuboidal. Simple cuboidal. Part of our distal convoluted tubule actually comes right back up here before it feeds into the collecting duct. Right next to the renal corpuscle, right next to the afferent arteriole. And while it's normally simple cuboidal, in this area, there are some very tightly packed columnar cells. And these tightly packed columnar cells are known as the macula densa cells. These macula densa cells are chemo and osmo receptors. Their job is to check the chemical and the osmolarity condition of the filtrate. Remember, at this point in the process, we basically have almost urine. It's not urine yet, but most of the processing should have been done. And basically these macula densa cells are the quality control. Their job is to check the composition of the filtrate. Are we over or under processing the filtrate? Because this would be a bad thing. Let's think about this. What happens if we over process? Well, let's start easy. What happens if we under process the filtrate? What happens if we under process the filtrate? True, we could have too much water. That could be one problem. But remember, we're looking, we're measuring the chemicals, we're measuring the osmolarity of it. Are we necessarily getting all the bad stuff out of, or all the good stuff out of it that we want to keep? You 
Yeah, if we're under processing the filtrate, then what that remember, we pulled 200 liters of stuff out and we want to bring 199 of those liters back in. So yes, we may have too much water in the urine, but also we're not going to be able to reabsorb everything we need from the filtrate. Right? Back in ancient times, there was a TV show called I Love Lucy. Right? That show ended, heck, I think Lucy died before any of you were probably born. But many of you have seen it in reruns because it's a very famous show. And one of the most famous episodes where, where she was sitting at this conveyor belt where she is checking candies. These little chocolate candies come out. And as these little chocolate candies come out, her job is to take it and put it in the paper cup. And first one comes out and she does it. And then the next one comes out and does it. And next one comes out and does it. And then they start coming out a whole lot faster. And as those candies start coming down the conveyor belt a whole lot faster, is she able to process and do everything she needs to them? No. And so she has to start eating them and throws them in her shirt and inside of her hat and all sorts of other things because she, it's going too fast, right? The problem is that we're making too much filtrate Too much filtrate and we can't process it fast enough. Okay, maybe none of you are interested in watching old black and white TV shows, but maybe back in ancient times when you're allowed to leave the house, some of you have gone to the Jelly Belly factory in Vacaville. Has anybody ever been to the Jelly Belly factory? There you go. I've gotten at least one person who said yes, absolutely. One of the best things about going is A, not only that you get to see the tour, B, not only that you get to see the samples, but C, one of the best, best things about it is they have these bags of rejects. What do they call those? Anybody ever buy those before? Nobody knows what I'm talking about. Not the gross ones. I'm not talking about gross flavors. There we go. That's what I was looking for. The belly flops. Absolutely. You can go and buy a bag of belly flops. The belly flops are way cheaper than the normal jelly beans. But why are they flops? Because they look funny. Maybe there's two that fuse together. Or maybe there's one that's real small. Or what, maybe it has a weird shape or something like that. Right? They're pulling out the bad ones. They're processing, they're the quality control, and they sell those. Now, obviously, if that conveyor belt's going too fast, they're not going to have a chance to pull out all the rejects. And so when you get the finished product, it's going to be under-processed because it went too fast. But notice the other problem would be true as well, right? If we make the filtrate too slowly, then in that case, what's going to happen is we're going to over-process the filtrate, right? If only one jelly bean is coming down every two minutes, well, you're going to get bored with that job, and you're going to start hyper-focusing on the jelly beans. Oh, the color on this one is just a teeny bit off. That one's got to be tossed. Oh, and this one is one quarter of a millimeter longer than the one before. That has to be tossed, and we're going to over-process it as well. So over-processing and under-processing the filtrate is bad. So this is where we check the condition of the filtrate. Am I making filtrate at an appropriate rate or am I under-processing it or am I over-processing? And if I'm doing it under, I'm doing it over, then I need to fix that. And the primary way I fix that is by controlling how much blood goes into the glomerulus, right? Think about it, if more blood enters the glomerulus, then we're gonna make more filtrate. And we could speed the process up. If less blood enters the glomerulus, then we're gonna make less filtrate. And that'll slow the process down. So the way that our macula densa cells do this 
is our macula densa cells release nitric oxide. Nitric oxide, remember, can dilate blood vessels. So if I release more, blood, the afferent arteriole dilates, more blood flows, more filtrate is made, or our macula densa cell can release less nitric oxide and our afferent arteriole constricts. And as a result of that, we get a less blood less filtrate is made. So the first cells involved in this process are those macula densa cells. And the second cells involved in this process are these cells on the afferent, oh, don't want that. Are these cells on the afferent arteriole? The afferent arteriole has these special cells And these special cells are part muscle cell, oops, and part endocrine. These cells are called juxtaglomerular cells. And the nice thing is once you've written that out once on an exam, you can then abbreviate them uh, JG cells. But the other thing these cells are known as, and this is an acceptable way to refer to them, is as granular cells. And that is because they're smooth muscle cells that have lots of vesicles. And those vesicles are what contain hormones that this cell can release. So this is where we release um, our erythropoietin. This is where we release that renin uh, and et cetera, stuff like that. Again, hormone, renin isn't a hormone, but it is a hormone-like uh, protein. And those there, so they are the ones that dilate and constrict, influencing blood flow to the capillary but also can release hormones or hormone-like proteins. Now, the third way, pardon me, the second way we can change the rate of filtration. Is by changing surface area of the glomerulus. Now, let's think about this. If we increase the surface area of the glomerulus, what would happen to our filtration rate? Would it go up or would it go down? Go uh, up. Excellent. And if we were to decrease the surface area of the glomerulus, then filtration would decrease. So what we need a way is to change the, not change the diameter, but change the surface area of the glomerulus. Get the glomerulus to change its shape. And the way we do that is by here, inside, again, not inside, between the loops of the glomerulus, in this space between the loops of the glomerulus, are special cells called mesangeal cells. These mesangeal cells, which are found in this location, contain actin. 
lots of actin filaments or what are also known as right, microfilaments. If you remember way back in 430, when we talked about the cytoskeleton of cells, actin allows for dynamic movements of cells. When these mesangeal cells receive a chemical signal from those macula densa cells, these mesangeal cells, and I'll write it up here so there's more space, and produce more actin, or they can break their actin down. What these cells do, let's say it actually this way. Our mesangeal cells can change their shape. One thing that these mesangeal cells can do is they can produce more actin filaments. And that causes the cell to expand. And if these mesangeal cells are expanding and they're underneath the capillaries, then as they expand, they push the capillaries out. And as they push the capillary loops out, does the surface area of the capillary go up or go down? Pushes the capillary out, and that increases the surface area. Conversely, these cells can also break down their actin. And as they break down their actin, the cells shrink. And when the cells shrink, the capillary collapses. And of course, when it collapses down, its surface area decreases. So by changing the surface area, expanding or collapsing the glomerulus, these mesangeal cells can increase and decrease the surface area to make more filtrate or to make less filtrate. So notice, based on what the macula densa cells tell them, the juxtaglomerular cells and the mesangeal cells can change the rate of filtration to either bring it up if we're over-processing it or bring it down if we're under-processing it. Let's take a look at the pretty picture from your textbook that does a better job of showing these cells. Notice here, Again, our distal convoluted tubule is normally simple cuboidal cells, but notice there are these tightly packed columnar cells right here, right next to the renal corpuscle. Notice here on our afferent arteriole, we have those granular cells, the juxtaglomerular cells. These are the ones that are muscle cells that can constrict or dilate the afferent arteriole bringing more blood in or less blood in. And they also have an endocrine function. They can make a hormone, right? Like EPO, they activate the calcitriol, they release the renin. So that not only can they have a local effect, but they can have a systemic effect as well. And then notice interdigitated within these are the mesangeal cells. Now notice they do distinguish that there are some mesangeal cells that are outside of the glomerulus and some that are inside. So there's extra glomerular and intraglomerular. I'm not gonna worry about that distinction. They're just mesangeal cells. And the key with these mesangeal cells is they can change their shape, not by contracting, but by making more or making less actin filaments. The actin can allow it to expand or collapse. So again, our macula densa, specialized chemo and osmolarity receptors in the distal convoluted tubule. That's our quality control, pro looking at the processing of our almost urine. Our juxtaglomerular cells or granular cells are on the afferent arteriole. They're smooth muscle that can change the diameter of the afferent arteriole but they can also release hormones. And then our mesangeal cells 
have those actin filaments allowing them to expand and contract, change their shape, get bigger or collapse, which increases or decreases the surface area of our glomerulus, which will affect our filtration rate. All right, questions on that. Notice our illustration shows this really, really nicely, but notice also Here we look at our urinary model. Here our urinary model shows that there are some tightly packed columnar cells in our distal convoluted tubule right next to our, uh, our glomerulus. Here we see the granular cells, juxtaglomerular cells on our afferent arteriole. And notice it doesn't show them the model doesn't show them, but if this had mesangeal cells, the mesangeal cells would be in all of these spaces inside of the capillary so that it could expand the capillary out and collapse it down. So this model doesn't show the mesangeal cells, but it does show the space where the mesangeal cells would be. So those three things together form the regulatory structure we call the juxtaglomerular apparatus. I have a question, mm -hmm. uh, just to clarify. So if our if we're under filtrating something, we're gonna dilate the blood vessels? No, if if yes, no, the other way around. If we are under filtrating, if we're under processing. That means we're making too much filtrate. The filtrate is going through too fast. And so we don't not have any chance to process it properly. So then we would need to slow it down. We would want to produce less filtrate in that case. If we are over processing it, that basically means we're nitpicking it and we have time to nitpick it because it's going too slow. So if we're over processing, then we need to speed up the filtrating process because it can handle more. So then we would constrict the blood vessels. Constricting the blood vessels would decrease the blood flow and would slow down the rate of filtration making. Oh, okay. I'm thinking of it as like, uh, if you constrict it, you're increasing the pressure, which would make you go faster, which is throwing me off, I think. Well, it would. So, but again, remember in this case, what we're doing is we're affecting the flow. You're right. Changing the diameter will affect pressure as well. And that is one of the issues we talk, we'll talk about. But we will talk about these regulatory processes in much more detail in the next class. All right. Okay. The other thing that I wanted to show you is I wanted to come back to this picture again. Is it possible to make this bigger? What happens if I click on it? Oh, it just opens it up, it doesn't help me. Yeah, it doesn't make it bigger. Oh, I guess I can cheat, but I don't know if I'll lose my resolution that way. That's not too bad. All right. Notice, as we said, we see all the distal and all the proxal convoluted tubules, and they are all cuboidal in shape. But once again, notice right here, right next to the glomerulus, we see some tightly packed cells. So notice those macula densa cells are something we can actually see. You guys can't see that image? Uh, hold on, let me see what if I do that. Can you see it now? Yeah. Okay, excellent, sorry. So notice here, again, we can see distal convoluted tubule, cuboidal, proximal convoluted tubule, cuboidal, right, proximal convoluted tubule, all these cuboidal structures, the distal and the proximal convoluted tubule, and they're all simple cuboidal. But notice right here, right next to the glomerulus, instead of being cuboidal cells, we have some very tightly packed columnar cells that are really, really tightly packed and close together right next to the renal corpuscle. Notice that macula densa is something we can actually see with a light microscope. So with a light microscope, we can actually identify those macula densa cells in a, in a, a histology slide. All right, 
So again, this is something that you can recognize in the models, something you can recognize on the illustrations and the charts, and, and something you can recognize histologically. So make sure you're familiar with that as well. All right, how are we on time? We are doing good, all right. Questions on that? All right, we have done the histology. Uh, we have done the anatomy. Those are the things that I wanted to do for that. So let's stop sharing that for a second. So what we can finally start talking about now, and I only want to do the briefest of introductions to this, is to talk about, so I need to come back here and share this. I want to very briefly talk about the physiology that we're going to be doing. So let's do this. Clear that, clear that. And let's draw out a simplified version of all of this. The simplified version of all of this involves that Bowman's capsule, no, let's make this black. Where it surrounds that renal corpuscle, it connects to, oh, let's cheat and do it this way. The renal tubules, and those renal tubules involve the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, and the distal convoluted tubule. We know these structures are fed into by our glomerulus, where here, we have our afferent arteriole. Here we have our glomerulus. Here we have our efferent arteriole. And here we have the paratubular capillaries and of course also our um, vasa recta in some cases. I don't know why I wrote that out when I abbreviated everything else. And as we've talked about, our goal is to start with that dirty blood entering into the nephron from the afferent arteriole. And at the end of this process, we have our clean blood that is gonna be in our venules going back. And of course, coming out of our distal convoluted tubule into our collecting duct. I guess we got to throw our collecting duct in there as well. And then out of our collecting duct, we have our urine. So that is our goal. In simplest terms, this is basically what we're doing. This process of filtering the blood, cleaning the blood and producing urine as a byproduct of this is a three step process. There are three steps in this process. The first step in this process is what we call glomerular filtration. Now, with a name like glomerular filtration, which way do you think materials go? Excellent, from the blood into the filtrate. Excellent, so materials are gonna flow out of the blood into the filtrate, perfect. And with a name like glomerular filtration, guess where this occurs? Well, out of the glomerulus into Bowman's capsule. So really, if you think about it, it occurs only in Bowman's cap, I mean, in renal corpuscle. Right, because it's coming out of that glomerulus being caught by Bowman's capsule. Now, 
this is going to be a passive process. Remind me again what that means. No ATP. Does not use ATP. That's good because we don't need to use ATP, but if we're not using ATP, can we be discriminative about what kind of things move out of the glomerulus? All right, so the problem with being passive is there's no discrimination. What this means is both quote unquote good and quote unquote bad things are gonna leave the blood. In fact, the only distinguishing characteristic is that filtration membrane. So really, this is determined by size only. Think of it this way, All right? You got a nice big long weekend coming up, Thanksgiving weekend, right? Now, for Thanksgiving weekend, right? You wanna, of course, like I do, get away from your family as much as possible. So you go to Hawaii for a week. When you come back, you've got a big, huge stack of mail. What's the first thing you do when you have that big, huge stack of mail? You separate it by size, small envelopes and all the big stuff. Most of the big stuff is going to be junk mail, but the keyword there is most. Might there be some important stuff in there? Absolutely. All right. Most of the small envelopes are going to be the important stuff, like the bills. But is there going to be a small advertisement in there asking you if you want to change your homeowner's assurance, even though you're living in an apartment? Yes. So really, again, we're not distinguishing by good or bad. We can't be discriminative. We can't be selective. I like that word better. Let's be certain. It's not selective. Right? So both good and bad. It's going to be only determined by size. Small stuff leaves with the water. So basically, small stuff and water leave the glomerulus. All right, that's going to be step one. Step two is called tubular reabsorption. With a name like tubular reabsorption, which way do you think things are going there? Excellent, from the filtrate into the blood. Again, we wanna be careful with in, in and out, you know, into the tubule, into the blood vessel. We wanna be more specific. Water goes uh, into the tubule, or we can say out of the filtrate into the uh, blood. Now, do we want any old thing coming back into the blood vessel? Remember, as we look at this illustration, anything that stays in the blood vessel stays in the body. Anything that stays in the tubule leaves the body. So we don't want just any old thing coming back. What kind of stuff do we want to come back? We want this to be a selective process, right? And what kind of stuff do we want to bring back? Right, we want to bring the quote unquote good stuff back into the blood. Now, if we want to be selective, what is that going to require? ATP. So this is an active process. Oops. Which means it requires ATP. All right, so we want to bring the good stuff back and put it into the blood. Now, the question is, again, with a name like tubular reabsorption, obviously this happens in the tubule. And indeed, it occurs along the entire 
renal tubules or nephron tubules. However, most of the processing occurs where? What did we say most of the processing was going to occur? Proximal convoluted tubule. Excellent. Questions on that? And that brings us to our third process. Our third process is tubular secretion. The name like tubular secretion, guess which way our materials and water are going to move. Out of the blood into the filtrate, excellent. Again, are we going to want any old stuff to come out of the blood into the tubule to be lost forever from the body? No, exactly. We want this to be a selective process. And absolutely, we want to kick the quote unquote bad stuff out of the blood. Really, if you think about it, out of the body. Of course, as we mentioned, if this is going to be a selective process, what does that tell us? It's got to be active. It is an active process that requires ATP. All right. Tubular secretion also occurs along the entire length of the nephron tubules. But again, most in this case of the processing occurs where? Where do you think most of the processing tubular secretion takes place? I got one, two. Most of the processing occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule. Remember, we said most of the processing occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule. The loop of Henle is about concentration. The distal convoluted tubule is about fine tuning. In fact, this really isn't a sequential event. Obviously, glomerular filtration has to occur first. Here in the glomerulus, here out of the glomerulus into the uh, Bowman's capsule. But tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion really aren't two and three. They're really more like 2A and 2B. Because both of these are going to be occurring at the same time. We're moving in different directions with different types of materials, but it's not like all the reabsorption occurs and then all of the tubular secretion occurs. Here in the proximal convoluted tubule, uh, it's orange, I'll make this small. Right here, only out. Here in the proximal convoluted tubule, we have lots of outward movement with that tubular secretion, but we have lots of inward movement. 
with that tubular reabsorption. So there is a ton of this going on in the proximal convoluted tubule, less in the loop of Henle. And in the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts, a lot less. But there's still both absorption, reabsorption, and secretion occurring along the entire length. And for both tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion, most of them occur in the proximal convoluted tubule. And so this is gonna be our goal for most of the next two days. Our goal for most of the next two days is to describe these three processes in detail, talk about them in detail, understand how they're regulated in detail, and then we'll finish things off on the last day with then voiding this urine from our body, which is not urination. If you think about what urination means, urination means the formation of urine. Guess what? Every single person in this class right now as we speak is urinating. You are all producing urine. Now, thankfully, urine shouldn't be leaking out of your body. Right? The act of voiding that urine, <laughs> that act of voiding the urine from your body is actually a process called micturition. <laughs> you guys are funny. Uh, it's micturition. So if the urine is leaking out of your body as we speak, that is micturition. You're not urinating. Urinating is formation of urine. Voiding is what we commonly think of as urination or micturition. <laughs> All right, excellent. That You guys made me laugh. That was funny. All right. Any other questions? All right, well, that is actually all I have for you today. We actually did a really good job of getting through that material, getting the histology. I guess that's the one nice thing about when you guys are all quiet and don't ask any questions, I get through the material quickly. So that is actually all I have for you today. So we get to finish a little bit early because I think this is going to be a great jumping off point on Thursday where we continue this discussion moving forward from here. All right. Yes, being able to urinate while I talk to you is definitely uh, one of the perks of an online class. Just please remember to have your camera and your microphone off while you're doing it. All right. Any other questions? All right, spectacular. That is all that I have for you guys today. So like I said, study hard, start looking at this material. Uh, again, I think the two homework assignments you have, the anatomy in unit 25, hopefully will be really helpful, but I also really like this lobster. I think this is a good lobster too. So uh, hopefully that should help you guys. And then we can really hit the ground running on Thursday with the physiology of this. All right, excellent. You guys have a, a great day, study hard and be safe. Uh, be healthy, and I uh, will see you guys on Thursday. Take care.